we can talk then. We can talk about right effort. Uh, possibly the best way to say it in the beginning is one's right effort is the very least amount of effort needed to get the job done. And that as right effort develops, it becomes not effort at all. It turns into energy or um, is dynamic or it's, it's spring-loaded. Um, an example of that is uh, that when you remember to take a deep breath, by the time you get to remembering done, the deep breath is already happening. So it doesn't take any effort. In the beginning, when the mind wanders away from the breath, it takes some effort to come back and start breathing again. Now, um, another quality of right effort has to do with the effort that we're putting in right this very instant, right this very moment. And yet, when we think about effort, we think about effort over a long period of time. Um, an example of that would be uh, making the statement of, this is hard, meditation is hard. Some people even go so far as to say it's too hard. No, each moment that you remember now is easy to, to take that deep breath because you remembered it. What makes it hard is because we're disappointed with our own intention or view of um, results and that students will then sit too long they've got some joy but then they'll after the joy is gone they'll sit kind of grinding their teeth wanting to work at regaining the joy that they have lost now um, an example of that would be like uh, chopping wood or some sort of physical exercise. And after you've chopped a cord of wood, now the body is really tired, but you think some reason or another that you've got to cut another cord of wood. But that second cord of wood is really, really a lot of work. You might have even had fun on uh, doing that first cord of wood, feeling um, confident and uh, useful. But that second cord of wood now is exhausted. And so here you come and saying that you're not, you think you're not putting enough effort in. The rails go off on me uh, in my <laughs> mind. Is you're already working too hard and you want to work even harder. Now there is a kind of place where the, uh, there's no effort at all which is, um, let us say, the other extreme. And that other extreme is no effort at all. But no effort at all in the sense of in this very moment. Uh, that the, um, the sati is there. The recognition is all the mind has wandered away from the breath. But then we still don't take a, a deep breath. What happens instead is, is that we begin to feel bad and say again, oh, this is a lot of work, this is too hard. And what they're really saying is, I don't like it when I do catch my mind wandering away. Because I already thought that I could do this, and now I find I can't do it. An example of that then could be said is, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But first, it's going to piss you off just a little bit. Well, if that's the case, then one's right effort is merely nothing more than getting pissed, off, uh, getting over the getting pissed off about what we don't like about ourselves. 
Now, the example that I use for that is imagine that you're standing in the middle of the road and a big truck comes by. What are you going to do when it's bearing right down on you? You're going to stand there and let it run over you? <laughs> are you going to try to stop that truck? No. That's working too hard. No, we're just going to merely stand out of the way. And the way of standing out of the way is by the recognition that the truck is there and that we need to move out, uh, out of the way just a little bit. And so the moving out of the way is one's right effort. No effort is standing and letting the truck run over us, and too much effort is trying to stop the truck. Does that, does that paint, paint an image for you? Mostly it has to do with the fact that you want something. You're dissatisfied with the way it is. And you say, oh, well, whatever it is that I want, I might be able to get it if I would work harder at it. Does that ring a bell? Perhaps, but it's it's uh, not the formal practice. I have been chasing something recently. And... Um, I, I guess the frustration is about plans. I'm listening. Okay, so uh, I like to play music from time to time. I won't call myself a musician, but um, I've, I've been really into playing uh, bass on piano and keyboard. So... I thought, why don't I just get a bass? I've played bass before. I liked it. I enjoyed it. Uh, so I was looking around. Should I buy new? Should I buy used? And I thought, okay, well, after I'm done with this, I'll I'll uh, I'll have my sit. Four hours later, I'm like, okay, I think I should have my sit now. You know. Uh I missed something in there. What happened in those in those hours? Four hours uh, later? Researching and contacting sellers and um, yeah. Did you enjoy doing that? It wasn't that bad. It, it was just it was just the uh, it was more so the desire to um, the desire and want to sit more than that. I think, because it was conflicting. Okay. You do begin to understand, though, that the issue that we're working here on is the desire itself. Mm. Okay. Well, if you're desiring to sit while you're having fun looking at, uh, I, I guess you're talking about bass guitar as opposed yeah. to a string bass. Yeah, yeah I'm talking about. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So if you're enjoying looking um, uh, on the internet or, or through brochures or whatever you're doing, or even going from uh, music store to music store, uh, which I don't think there's got that many of them in your area. But meanwhile, you know what I'm talking about <laughs> is that they uh, that doing that is OK to do. But what you're saying to yourself is, but I should not be doing this. I should be meditating. Mm. Is that correct? Pretty much. Okay. Well, that should in your mind, which is kind of a rule, maybe it's a new rule, but you made a rule that you should meditate more or that you should meditate. And that you poked it into the same box that you poke all of your rules. That goes into the rule box. You made a rule for yourself, and now you're beating yourself up with the rule that you made. <laughs> right? And so you become dissatisfied with what you were doing. And the whole point is begin to do, become satisfied with everything you're doing in your life. And so we do a, a lot of uh, techniques and whatnot uh, to... Um, help the student to wake up <clears throat> all throughout the day. This is one point of time 
when it would have been marvelous had you woken up. In other words, instead of saying, I should meditate, and then telling yourself, I should meditate for four hours while you're having fun in the, uh, uh, the string bass, you should wake up to, oh, look at what I'm doing to myself. I'm telling myself I should do something, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing now. Let me do what I'm doing now, and we'll sit later. And now I can enjoy looking at bass and sit later. And when you sit, can you sit and enjoy your sitting? Or are you going to then, while you're sitting, think about buying a bass? Because now you're wanting a bass instead of enjoying your sitting. It really is that easy, but we have to get our, our mind around the fact that we have to take care of this present moment. Well, the first that's the only time that you've got. You just have a whole lot of it. <laughs> the, the, the dukkha, so to speak, um, of wanting to meditate while I'm online shopping or online browsing or whatever feels a lot grosser than the, than the dukkha of seeing a, a thought of thinking of electric basses during meditation, that's easy. During meditation, you know, during when there's uh, more s samadhi, um, and I can see, oh, that you know, that's that. Let's carry on. And I mean, that's. I don't think it's really a problem. Uh, yeah, but I think that problem's harder to see when I'm not formally meditating. Quote, that's, that's the whole point. Well, what we need to do then is look at the sitting meditation as a practice so that we develop the skill of sati or remembering so that you can remember to look at what you're thinking and feeling even when you're out shopping for bases. That we need that mindfulness all the time. Actually, here's one of the ways of saying it. Forgive me again if I'm repeating myself now. But advice. Advice is easy to come by, and there are lots and lots of sources of advice. You can get good advice from lawyers, doctors, uh, police, teachers. It, good advice is just all over the place. The Buddha's advice tends to be top quality. But the whole point about advice is, is that uh, it's only good when we remember to take that advice. And that the time when we don't take the advice is probably just at the point of time when we need it most. If that's true, then this is uh, just another statement of Murphy's Law. You know Murphy's Law? Yeah. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, and it'll go wrong at the worst possible moment. An example I use is the hotel got a new computer system, or actually the new, it's a new hotel with a new computer system. When does the computer system fail? Probably not on when the opening night. <laughs> yes, when it's full. When the hotel gets full, that's when the computer fails, because that's the worst possible time for it to fail. And it's also when the computer is, 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 is being taxed the most. All right? All right. So that's exactly what we need to, to keep in mind when we start... Um, let us say, um, beginning to add to the list of things to be on guard for. That basically we learn to be on guard in the sitting meditation, but in the living meditation, the walking around and living our life meditation, tends to get us, uh, our, um, tends to point out that, there, that we have our favorite kind of um, uh, 
problem that we keep creating the same kind of problem over and over and over again in the mind. And then the one that you've identified there is the one we're going to put that item on your list. The first item on your to do list is to be on guard for I should be doing something else other than what I'm doing right now. So let that be on the top of your stack for Sati. Whenever you have the thought, I should be doing something else other than what I'm doing now. Wake up. Wake up. That's the way of looking at it. Is these are. Um, let us say that when the wine wanders, it tends to have favorite places, favorite watering holes, favorite uh, homes to go to. And that one of them is uh, us telling ourselves that we should be doing this, we should be doing that. That what we're doing now is not good enough. We should be doing something else. So, start watching for that. In fact, if you had not already begun to wake up to it, you wouldn't have mentioned it. Except that when you did mention it, you mentioned it in the sense of you're feeling guilty because you're not meditating enough. And my answer to that is, right then you weren't meditating enough. (laughs) 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 That this is the quality of the meditation is to wake up just when we need it, just in time, wake up. So that you don't put yourself through that kind of hassle. Hey, if you're enjoying looking at bases, enjoy looking at bases. But here you are looking at bases, enjoying looking at bases, and hating yourself because you're not meditating. Well, maybe hatred's a little strong, but at least hassling yourself that you ought to be doing something else. Now I ask you, reflecting back, do you think you've ever done that before? Many times. Pardon? Um, I mean... Did you say many times? Yeah, I said many times. Many times. How many times do you recognize that you're doing it? I mean, of the many times that you know, you can imagine that that probably needs to be uh, set to some high power or something. That you've only been aware of it just occasionally. But now that you're going to be on strong guard for it, you're going to start seeing it a lot. Every time you do, you can say, "Uh aha, I caught you. I see that. (laughs) But as I, I ask many students, do you expect to learn to sit meditation so that you can sit longer and longer and longer so that now you can sit all day and maybe you sit in a cave for nine years or maybe spend 17 hours a day sitting in some temple in Burma or something like that. Is that your idea? I don't think so. No, nobody wants to live their life like that. In fact, those who do live their lives like that is simply because they're wanting something that they think sitting like that is going to get for them. That if they could actually learn to be satisfied while they're sitting, then they could develop being satisfied when they got up and walked around. Right. So it makes no sense at all to be developing for solely a sitting meditation. In that regard, and in fact, I probably should have told you this if I hadn't already, I don't even consider myself a meditation teacher. (laughs) That I'm a Dhamma teacher. And the Dhamma is all the time, not just while you're sitting on the floor. And so while you're um, looking through some brochures and thinking about buying a base, oh, that one's nice, you know, this is, oh, wait a minute, I should be sitting in meditation. I ought not to be having fun looking at a book. And then you wake up. Look at what I'm doing. 
Why can't I just enjoy what I'm doing? Why do I have to put this I should be doing something else stuff in there? Is that something I should be um, kind of, I, th I can't remember what, uh, I think Tanisaro calls it skillful verbal fabrication or something like that, where you, you just tell yourself it at that point. Is that is that something useful to do in this situation? Yeah. Like a koan? Mm-hmm. But the koan that I was already giving you was... What's wrong with what I'm doing right now? Mm, that's the what I mean, yeah. Yeah, what's wrong with it? I'm, I'm having fun. Let's <laughs> enjoy life. Which is always I should be doing something else. I remember when I was a young adult. And in fact, when I was studying psychology is when I put this together that every Sunday night would be a time of anxiety for me. Every Sunday or Saturday? Sunday night. Sunday. Sunday night was a time of anxiety. Because when I was a kid, we had to go to church on Sunday night, which I didn't want to do, didn't like to do it. Uh, whatever they did on Sunday morning was not nearly as bad as what they did on Sunday night. Uh, and there was some pretty good television on on Sunday night. And all weekend long, I had not done my homework. <laughs> and so Sunday night here, I'm faced with this, this uh, dilemma that literally would tear me up inside over, am I going to do my homework? Am I going to watch television? Or am I going to, can I get away with not going to church? No, I can't. I'd rather watch television. I can't do that. I have to do my homework, and I can't do that because I've got to go to church. And so that was the uh, uh, the dilemma that I was in, and it stayed. And I figured that out, and so it took me uh, a few Sunday nights later to keep telling myself, it's okay, Sunday night's just like any other night of the week, no problem. And I would talk myself into with that skillful means uh, uh, with, that you're talking about with uh, Tenisaro. But yeah, I was able to talk, basically talk myself out of it, and I'd never been able to talk myself out of it if I hadn't been able to see myself in it. And that most profound way of talking ourselves out of it is the way that the Buddha said it when he was sitting under the bow tree. Aha, uh -huh, I see you. I see you, Mara. And so you can say that to yourself. Uh -huh, I see me trying to tell myself what I'm doing now is not good enough and I should be doing something else. And allow yourself to have the enjoyment of what you're doing. That you don't have to worry about sitting longer and practicing more. What you actually... Um, can have is the permission to enjoy your life. That if anything, that's actually what uh, uh, meditation is a training for, is, is for the, the student to feel the power. Um, the, the three P's is permission, protection, and potency. Uh, protection means that this is a safe thing to do, and power is I've got the right attitude. But we also have to somehow or another give ourselves permission to be okay. To give yourself permission that it's okay that you look in a book for basis. That you don't have to be doing something else all the time. You can begin to enjoy your life. I give you that permission. <laughs> the potency is going to come along, but you have to have that permission in the beginning. And a lot of students, they don't give themselves permission to actually enjoy their life. 
that it's not something to be earned. You've already got it. It's to be enjoyed. That's what we don't know how to do. That there really is nothing to be earned. There's no barter or business deal to be made. All we have to do is remember that you're already okay. Or if you want to get highfalutin about it, you're already enlightened. All you have to do is remember that you are. <laughs> or if you really want to go upstairs, you are... That, the, the way to introduce it is thou art that. This is it. Mm. Thou art that, which means that literally you are the god of your own reality. You are the, the emperor of your own politics. That makes you a god. So, you're a god, you're enlightened, you're an emperor, you're a lion. Now, that's a pretty good attitude to have. <laughs> You've already got it. You're already there. This is the permission that you need. You need to have the permission to pick up your paycheck that you've already earned. To, to what extent does first jhana <laughs> come into daily life? I'm just thinking back to... Um, when you mentioned the Buddha thinking, why am I so afraid of this pleasure from mm -hmm. first jhana? Well, this state that we're talking about is that state of satisfaction where we're breathing well, the mind is fit for work, and we're putting it to work to, to, to see it through wisdom that you are okay. Rather than listening to the rules listening to all that you've ever heard and all of the stuff that you got when you were a child. Because when you were a kid, you were a little thing. You had to have somebody else to wipe your butt, put your diaper on, put food in your mouth. You couldn't even do that much by yourself. And later you were uh, at the beck and call of the adults. You go do what I tell you to do. You go sit down and you do your homework. You go to your room. Go clean your room. I mean, how many times do you see kids getting ordered around? That, in fact, I, I, I have said it recently, even. If you talk to a cop the way you talk to that child, that cop would either bust you <laughs> or bust you up. But we don't talk to our children the way that we would talk to a policeman. No, we talk to them like they're a piece of trash. And so here we are as kids being traumatized by the adults. And we grow up with that. So all of the rules and all the shoulds and all the reckonings that you've had, shoulds and couldas and would have, that's stored in that parent ego state. And you need to see that stuff when it comes up. Look what you're doing to yourself. You're intentionally trying to make yourself miserable again. The parent in you is trying to defeat the child in you because that's what you saw when you were a kid. It is the kid inside of you is being defeated by the, the adults or the, the parents around you. And so you're keeping that same scenario going. So now you need permission to come out of that. But you don't need permission from me. You need to give that permission <laughs> to yourself. Mm. It is okay that you have a happy life. And you do not have to listen to all of the rules and all the should haves and would haves and could haves because when you do, that's dissatisfying. That's suffering. Listening to all of that crap that you keep telling yourself is what the problem is. And when you stop listening to that and start playing with the new toys you've got, now you can have a happy life. 
Hmm. Ah, okay. <laughs> No, I just, I just saw, I just uh, saw for a, a brief moment that I've, I've kind of built up a routine over the last week, and even though I knew of it as a routine, I didn't really think of it as something from the past. You know, like something that I used to do. It's just an, a habit that has propped up again without me questioning it. And which is funny because I, I was doing uh, I was doing something every day, um, playing a video game. And yesterday I I uh, I didn't I didn't play said video game. And I thought how how wonderful how wonderful it is that if there's something that I. If there's something that I don't want to do, I don't have to do it. Or that I, you know, I don't have to get caught up in routines. But then at the same time, there's a completely new routine uh, that just went went past me without me even seeing it. Okay. So now you're going to start paying attention to that stuff. Hmm. Be on guard for it. You start start noticing how you hassle yourself. There are many things that people do. Some people get really tense and uptight. They can do their job when they're alone, but when other people come by, especially if they're critical or a boss or something, the guy gets all uptight, tense, and then he can't handle his boss very well and he looks bad. So for him, being on guard for how am I feeling while I'm getting engaged with and being engaged with other people, that's what he needs to be on guard for. For you, a little bit different. You need to be on guard for hassling yourself, telling yourself that what you're doing is not good enough. You should be doing something else. I bet you do that a lot. <laughs> nothing is ever good enough whatever you're doing now is not good enough there's another way of hassling yourself and that is being in a hurry whatever you're doing right now is the right thing to do you're just not doing it fast enough you need to do more of it quicker better and so being on guard for that to make sure that you're going at a pace, you're going slow, that you're not getting in a hurry. And so these are very characteristics uh, to the way that people uh, put things on their short list yeah, of what to be on guard for. Childhood and, and um, formative years, I did, I did rush around like that, but not so much or not as much now. Okay, so now let yourself have permission to do what you want to do and enjoy it without having something else that you should be doing. And now you have a lot of time on your hands. And so um, when you're doing, I, I would say to to work maybe with the computer or the laptop that when you're on some days it's okay to play the laptop and you enjoy it and on other days you're going to set the laptop aside or maybe in the morning you're going to be doing laptop but in the afternoon you set it aside and you just uh, work with being here now you don't have to sit or do anything but just make sure that the important thing is, is to keep only wholesome thoughts. What's happening right now? Unwholesome thoughts, would, whatever it is right now, you should be doing something else. That's not a wholesome thought. The wholesome mm -hmm. thought would be just enjoying the moment. And so then when you are on the computer, you would do the same thing in, in that regard of being mindful enough that what you're doing on the computer is useful, valuable, and wholesome and entertaining 
as opposed to doing things on the computer that's not wholesome. And I can give you a whole uh, uh, list of four-letter words <laughs> about what not what's not worth, like uh, four-letter words like news, <laughs> porn, <laughs> those kind of words. MSNBC, that's four letters. No, that's five, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, staying uh, on the computer, doing only things that are useful, like looking up stuff on the Dhamma, talking with Dhamma friends, um, uh, doing doing research that's interesting for you, even research into musical instruments and things like that. Spending some time with music is a very enjoyable thing to do, unless you're hassling about it because you should be meditating instead. Then it's not so enjoyable. <laughs> But that's because it's the hassling that you're doing that's not enjoyable. So that's the thing to be on guard for. Whatever you're doing, look at that hassling so that you can put it to a stop. And sometimes it'll come back, but when you when it does, you're on top of it. has to do with satisfaction, not the number of hours you're sitting. If you rack up 10,000 hours of meditation, that may be something to be proud of, but whether it's uh, satisfying or not, that's a different question, and that's up to you, depending upon your right attitude. If you have the right attitude, then yeah, this is good. Even if it's only the first hour of meditation, if it's good, then it's good enough. You don't need 10,000 of them if the first one will do. And if you're still not satisfied after 10,000 hours, then what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> So how many hours you put in a meditation is irrelevant. But rather it's, are you getting the benefit out of the meditation? And the benefit is deep satisfaction. And where does deep satisfaction come from? It comes from the practice of shallow satisfaction. The satisfaction is satisfaction, you know. That's the point that's really so hard for folks to get a hold of. Is mm -hmm. a little bit of satisfaction is all you ever need. But the more you practice it, the more you get of it. But if you want a whole lot of satisfaction, then we're not satisfied with little satisfaction, which means now we have no satisfaction at all. We're dissatisfied and we want something we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. So enjoy. Enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy, enjoy the PC. Enjoy looking at uh, bases. Uh, you might enjoy buying one and picking up and learning to play it. But if you do buy it, pick it up and learn to play it. Don't hassle yourself. Why you should be meditating while you're playing the bass? That just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I guess that's what makes what they call meditation a tricky business is because we've always done things with uh, in an indirect fashion that if I want this, I've got to do that. If I do that, I'll get this. If I want gold, I've got to go dig a gold mine or go pan for gold. And if I pan for gold enough, then I'll have gold. 
So it's always do this to get that. But in this stuff with the mind, it's direct. You don't have to go pan for gold to get gold. You've already got gold. So that's why the, the Zen come to the point of saying no place to go and nothing to do. And the spring comes and the grass grows by itself because we're satisfied. We come to the point there's nothing to do. Why? Because all that I ever did before was because I was unhappy and dissatisfied with things. So I was going after doing this in order to get that. Now that I've got that, <laughs> nothing to do. <laughs> So this is what we need to practice because we're in such a bad habit of doing this to get that without understanding we've already got that. We've already got it. It really does take me back to my uh, the time at the Zen monastery in the UK. It's quite some em embarrassing conversations had with some of the monks. Oh, really? I don't know about that. You were embarrassed or they were? I think it was you. In, that was it. Yeah, in, in, <laughs> in hindsight. So what they were telling you about the same thing as I'm telling you, huh? Yeah, and I kind of, I kind of got it after a while, but it's easy. I don't know. It, it seems easy to forget sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right, and so that's why sati is to remember, <laughs> because it's so easy to forget and go back to the personality that we have grown into. But you can change, and you know you can change. <laughs> My pens ran out. Your pen. Yeah. <laughs> or at least it's the, the ink stopped flowing. Oh. Okay. Uh, the other day I got a lighter and uh, I know heated up the ends, gave it a tap, and it it worked for a little bit. Well, I think that we probably covered this topic pretty well. Yeah. So we, you have you have something to be on guard for. To remember to be on guard, to not hassle yourself, mm. to bring that to a close. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Demarado. All right. We'll see you bye -bye. soon. See you soon. Okay. Bye bye.